Chapter five, Puddle Glum. Jill was asleep. Ever since the Owl's Parliament began, she had been yawning terribly, and now she had dropped off. She was not at all pleased at being waked again, and at finding herself lying on bare boards in a dusty belfry, sort of place completely dark and almost completely full of owls. She was even less pleased when she heard that they had to set off for somewhere else, and not apparently for bed, on the owl's back. Oh, come on, Paul, buck up said Scrub's voice. After all, it is an adventure. <clears throat> I'm sick of adventures, said Jill crossly. She did, however, consent to climb onto Glimfeather's back and was thoroughly waked up for a while by the unexpected coldness of the air when he flew out with her into the night. The moon had disappeared and there were no stars. Far behind her, she could see a single lighted window well above the ground doubtless in one of the towers of Ker Paravel. It made her long to be back in that delightful bedroom, snug in bed, watching the firelight on the walls. She put her hands under her cloak and wrapped it tightly round her. It was uncanny to hear two voices in the dark air a little distance away. Scrub and his owl were talking to one another. He doesn't sound tired, thought Jill. She did not realize that he had been on great adventures in that world before, and that the Narnian air was bringing back to him a strength he had won when he sailed the eastern seas with King Caspian. Jill had to pinch herself to keep awake, for she knew that if she dozed on Glimfeather's back, she would probably fall off. When at last the two owls ended their flight, she climbed stiffly off Glimfeather and found herself on flat ground. A chilly wind was blowing, and they appeared to be in a place without trees. To who, to who, Glimfeather was calling. Wake up, Puddle Glum, wake up. It is on the lion's business. For a long time, there was no reply. Then a long way off, a dim light appeared and began to come nearer. With it came a voice. Owls ahoy, it said. What is it? Is the king dead? Has an enemy landed in Narnia? Is it a flood or dragons? When the light reached them, it turned out to be that of a large lantern. Jill could see very little of the person who held it. He seemed to be all legs and arms. The owls were talking to him, explaining everything, but she was too tired to listen. She tried to wake herself up a bit when she realized that they were saying goodbye to her, but she could never afterwards remember much except that sooner or later she and Scrub were stooping to enter a low doorway and then, oh thank heavens, were lying down on something soft and warm, and a voice was saying, there you are, best we can do. You'll lie cold and hard, damp too, I shouldn't wonder. Won't sleep a wink, most likely, even if there isn't a thunderstorm or a flood or a wigwam doesn't fall down on top of us all, as I've known them to do. Must make the best of it. But she was fast asleep be before the voice had ended. When the children woke late the next morning, they found that they were lying very dry and warm on beds of straw in a dark place. A triangular opening let, <clears throat> let in the daylight. Where on earth are we? asked Jill. In the wigwam of a marsh wiggle, said Eustace. A what? A marsh wiggle? Don't ask me what it is. I couldn't see it last night. I'm getting up. Let's go and look for it. How beastly one feels after sleeping in one's clothes, said Jill, sitting up. I was just thinking how nice it was not to have to dress, said Eustace. <laughs> or wash either, I suppose, said Jill scornfully. But Scrub had already got up, 
yawned, shaken himself, and crawled out of the wigwam. Jill did the same. What they found outside was quite unlike the bit of Narnia they had seen on the day before. They were on a great flat plain, which was cut into countless little islands by countless channels of water. The islands were covered with coarse grass and bordered with reeds and rushes. Sometimes there were beds of rushes about an acre in extent. Clouds of birds were constantly alighting in them and rising from them again. Duck, snipe, bitterns, herons. Many wigwams like that in which they had passed the night could be seen dotted about, but all at a good distance from one another. For marsh wiggles are people who like privacy. Except for the fringe of the forest several miles to the south and west of them, there was not a tree in sight. Eastward, the flat marsh stretched to low sand hills on the horizon, and you could tell by the salt tang in the wind which blew from that direction that the sea lay over there. To the north, there were low pale colored hills and places bastioned with rock. The rest was all flat marsh. It would have been a depressing place on a wet evening, seen under a morning sun, with a fresh wind blowing and the air filled with the crying of birds, there was something fine and fresh and clean about its loneliness. The children felt their spirits rise. Where has the thingy gummy got to, I wonder, said Jill. The marsh wiggle, said Scrub, as if he were rather proud of knowing the word. I expect, hello, that must be him. And then they both saw him sitting with his back to them, fishing about 50 yards away. He had been hard to see at first because he was nearly the same color as the marsh and because he sat so still. <clears throat> I suppose we'd better go and speak to him, said Jill. Scrub nodded. They both felt a little nervous. As they drew nearer, the figure turned its head and showed them a long, thin face with rather sunken cheeks, a tightly shut mouth, a sharp nose, and no beard. He was wearing a high pointed hat like a steeple with an enormously wide flat brim. The hair, if it could be called hair, which hung over his large ears was greeny gray, and each lock was flat rather than round, so that they were like tiny reeds. His expression was solemn, his complexion muddy, and you could see at once that he took a serious view of life. <clears throat> good morning, guests, he said. Though when I say good, I don't mean it won't probably turn to rain, or it might be snow or fog or thunder. You didn't get any sleep, I dare say. <clears throat> yes, we did, though, said Jill. We had a lovely night. Ah, said the Marsh Wiggle, shaking his head. I see you're making the best of a bad job. That's right. You've been well brought up, you have. You've learned to put a good face on things. <clears throat> Please, we don't know your name, said Scrub. Puddlegum's my name, but it doesn't matter if you forget it. I can always tell you again. The children sat down on each side of him. They now saw that he had very long legs and arms, so that although his body was not much bigger than a dwarf's, he would be taller than most men when he stood up. The fingers of his hands were webbed like a frog's, and so were his bare feet, which dangled in the muddy water. He was dressed in earth-colored clothes that hung loose about him. I'm trying to catch a few eels to make an eel stew for dinner, said Puddlegum. Though I shouldn't wonder if I didn't get any. And you won't like them much if I do. Why not? asked Scrub. Why, it's not in reason that you should like our sort of victuals, though I've no doubt you'll put a bold face on it. All the same, while I am trying to catching of them, if you two could try to light the fire, no harm in trying. The woods behind the wigwam, it may be wet. You could light it inside the wigwam and then we'd get all the smoke in our eyes. Or you could light it outside and then the rain would come and put it out. Here's my tinderbox. You won't know how to use it, I expect. 
but Scrub had learned that sort of thing on his last adventure. The children ran back together to the wigwam, found the wood, which was perfectly dry, and succeeded in lighting a fire with rather less than the usual difficulty. Then Scrub sat and took care of it while Jill went and had some sort of wash, not a very nice one, in the nearest channel. After that, she saw to the fire and he had to wash. Both felt a good deal fresher, but very hungry. Presently, the marsh wiggle joined them. In spite of his expectation of catching no eels, he had a dozen or so, which he had already skinned and cleaned. He put a big pot on, mended the fire, and lit his pipe. Marsh wiggles smoke a very strange, heavy sort of tobacco. Some people say they mix it with mud. And the children noticed the smoke from puddle from Puddle Glum's pipe hardly rose in the air at all. It trickled out of the bowl and downwards and drifted along the ground like a mist. It was very black and set Scrub coughing. Now, said Puddle Glum, those eels will take a mortal long time to cook, and either of you might faint with hunger before they're done. I knew a little girl, but I'd better not tell you that story. It might lower your spirits, and that's a thing I never do. So, to keep your minds off your hunger, we may as well talk about our plans. <clears throat> yes, let's do, said Jill. Can you help us to find Prince Rillian? The marsh wiggled, sucked in his cheeks till they were hollower than you would have thought possible. Well, I don't know that you'd call it. Help, he said. I don't know that anyone can exactly help. It stands to reason we're not likely to get very far on a journey to the north, not at this time of the year, with the winter coming on soon and all. And an early winter, too, by the look of things. But you mustn't let that make you downhearted. Very likely, with what with enemies and mountains and rivers to cross and losing our way, and next to nothing to eat and sore feet, we'll hardly notice the weather. And if we don't get far enough to do any good, we may get far enough not to get back in a hurry. Both children noticed that he said, we, not you, and both exclaimed at the same moment, are you coming with us? Oh yes, I'm coming, of course. Might as well, you see. I don't suppose we shall ever see the king back in Narnia, now that he's once set off for foreign parts, and he had a nasty cough when he left. Then there's Trumpkin. He's failing fast, and you'll find there'll have been a bad harvest after this terrible dry summer. And I shouldn't wonder if some enemy attacked us. Mark my words. <clears throat> and... How shall we start, said Scrub. Well, said the Marsh Wiggle very slowly, all the others, whoever went looking for Prince Drillian, started from that same fountain where the Lord Drinian saw the lady. They went north, mostly. And as none of them ever came back, we can't exactly say how they got on. <clears throat> We've got to start by finding a ruined city of giants, said Jill. Aslan said so. <clears throat> got to start by finding it, have we? Answered Puddleglum. Not allowed to start by looking for it, I suppose. That's what I meant, of course, said Jill. And then we found it. <clears throat> and then when we found it. Yes, when said Puddle Glum very dryly. Doesn't anyone know where it is? asked Scrub. I don't know about anyone, said Puddle Glum, and I won't say I haven't heard of that ruined city. You wouldn't start from the fountain, though. You'd have to go across Ettensmore. That's where the ruined city is, if it's anywhere. But I've been as far in that direction as most people, and I never got to any runes, so I won't deceive ya. 
Where's Ettenmore? said Scrub. Look over there, northward, said Puddlegum, pointing with his pipe. See those hills and bits of cliff? Lots the beginning of Ettensmore. But there's a river between it and us. The river Shribble. No bridges, of course. <clears throat> I suppose we can ford it, though, said Scrub. Well, it has been forded, admitted the Marsh Wiggle. Perhaps we shall meet people on Ettensmore who can tell us the way, said Jill. You're right about meeting people, said Puddleglum. What sort of people live there? She asked. It's not for me to say they aren't all right in their own way, answered Puddleglum, if you like their way. Yes, but what are they? Pressed Jill. There are so many strange creatures in this country. I mean, are they animals or birds or dwarfs or what? The Marsh Wiggle gave a long whistle. Phew, he said. Don't you know? I thought the owls had told you. They're giants. Jill winced. She had never liked giants, even in books, and she had once met one in a nightmare. Then she saw Scrub's face, which had turned rather green, and thought to herself, I bet he's in a worse funk than I am. That made her feel braver. <clears throat> The king told me long ago, said Scrub, that time when I was with him at sea, that he jolly well beaten those giants in war and made them pay him tribute. <clears throat> That's true enough, said Puddleglum. He'll at peace with us all right. As long as we stay on our side of the shribble, they won't do us any harm. Over on their side, on the moor, still there's always a chance. If we don't get near any of them, and if none of them forget themselves, and if we're not seen, it's just possible we might get a long way. Look here, said Scrub, suddenly losing his temper, as people so easily do when they have been frightened. I don't believe the whole thing can be half as bad as you're making out, any more than the beds in the wigwam were hard or the wood was wet. I don't think Aslan would ever have sent us if there was so little chance as all that. He quite expected the Marsh Wiggle to give him an angry reply, but he only said, That's the spirit, Scrub. That's the way to talk. Put a good face on it. But we all need to be very careful about our tempers, seeing all the hard times we shall have to go through together. Who won't do to quarrel, you know. At any rate, don't begin it too soon. I know these expeditions usually end that way, knifing one another. I shouldn't wonder before it's all done. But the longer we can keep off it... <clears throat> well, if you feel it so hopeless, interrupted Scrub, I think you'd better stay behind. Paul and I can go on alone, can't we, Paul? Shut up and don't be an ass, Scrub, said Jill hastily, terrified lest the Marsh Wiggles should take him at his word. Don't you lose heart, Paul, said Puddleglum. Oh, I'm coming, sure, and certain. I'm not going to lose an opportunity like this. It will do me good. They all say, I mean, all the other Wiggles all say, that I'm too flighty. <clears throat> don't take life seriously enough. If they've said it once, they've said it a thousand times. Puddleglum, they've said. You're altogether too full of bobbins and bounce and hoy spirits. You have got to learn that life isn't all fricasseed frogs and eel pie. You want something to sober you down a bit. We're only saying it for your own good, Puddleglum. That's what they say. Now, a job like this. A journey up north, just as winter's beginning, looking for a prince who probably isn't there, by way of a ruined city that no one has ever seen, will be just the thing. If that doesn't study a chap, oh, I don't know what will. And he rubbed his big frog-like hands together, as if he were talking of going to a party or a pantomime. 
And now, he added, let's see how those eels are getting on. When the meal came, it was delicious, and the children had two large helpings each. At first, the marsh wiggle wouldn't believe that they really liked it, and when they had eaten so much that he had to believe them, he fell back on saying that it would probably disagree with them horribly. What's food for wiggles? Maybe poison for humans? I shouldn't wonder, he said. After the meal, they had tea in tins, as as you've seen men having it who are working on the road. And Puddleglum had a good many sips out of a square black bottle. He offered the children some of it, but they thought it very nasty. The rest of the day was spent in preparations for an early start the next morning. Puddleglum, being far the biggest, said he would carry three blankets with a large bit of bacon rolled up inside them. Jill was to carry the remains of the eels, some biscuit, and the tinderbox. Scrub was to carry both his own cloak and Jill's when they didn't want to wear them. Scrub, who had learned some shooting when he sailed to the east under Caspian, had Puddleglum's second best bow, and Puddleglum had his best one, though he said that what with winds and damp bowstrings and bad light and cold fingers, it was a hundred to one against either of them hitting anything. He and Scrub both had swords. Scrub had brought the one which had been left out for him in his room at Caraparavel, but Jill had to be content with her knife. There would have been a quarrel about this, but as soon as they started sparring, the Wiggle rubbed his hands and said, Ah, oh, there you are. Oh, I thought as much. That's what usually happens on adventures. This made them both shut up. All three went to bed early in the wigwam. This time, the children really had a rather bad night. That was because Puddleglum, after saying, You'd better try for some sleep, you two. Not that I suppose any of us will close an eye tonight, instantly went off into such a loud, continuous snore that when Jill at last got to sleep, she dreamed all night about road drills and waterfalls and being in express trains in tunnels. Chapter 6 the Wild Wastelands of the North. At about nine o'clock the next morning, three lonely figures might have been seen picking their way across the shrivel by the shoals and stepping stones. It was a shallow, noisy stream, and even Jill was not wet above her knees when they reached the northern bank. About 50 yards ahead, the land rose up to the beginning of the moor, everywhere steeply and often in cliffs. <clears throat> I suppose that's our way, said Scrub, pointing left and west to where a stream flowed down from the moor through a shallow gorge, but the marsh wiggle shook his head. The giants mainly live along the, si <clears throat> the side of that gorge, he said. You might say the gorge was like a street to them. We'll do better straight ahead, even though it's a bit steep. <clears throat> they found a place where they could scramble up, and in about ten minutes stood panting at the top. They cast a longing look back at the valley land of Narnia, and then turned their faces to the north. The vast, lonely moor stretched on and up as far as they could see. On their left was rockier ground. Jill thought that must be the edge of the giant's gorge and did not much care about looking in that direction. They set out. It was good, springy ground for walking and a day of pale winter sunlight. As they got deeper into the moor, the loneliness increased. One could hear peewits and see an occasional hawk. When they halted in the middle of the morning for a rest and a drink in a little hollow by a stream, Jill was beginning to feel that she might enjoy adventures after all, and said so. We haven't had any yet, said the Marsh Wiggle. Walks after the first halt 
like school mornings after break or railway journeys after changing trains, never go on as they were before. When they set out again, Jill noticed that the rocky edge of the gorge had drawn nearer, and the rocks were less flat, more upright than they had been. In fact, they were like little towers of rock, and what funny shapes they were. I do believe, thought Jill, that all the stories about joints might have come from those funny rocks. If you were coming along here when it was half dark, <clears throat> you could easily think those piles of rocks were giants. Look at that one now. You could almost imagine that the lump on top was a head. It would be rather too big for the body, but it would do well enough for an ugly giant. And all that bushy stuff. I suppose it's heather and bird's nests, really. <clears throat> Wouldn't it do quite well for hair and beard? And the things sticking out on each side are quite like ears. They'd be horribly big, but then I dare say giants would have big ears like elephants and oh her blood froze the thing moved it was a real giant there was no mistaking it she had seen it turn its head she had caught a glimpse of the great stupid puff cheeked face all the things were giants not rocks there were 40 or 50 of them all in a row obviously standing with their feet on the bottom of the gorge and their elbows resting on the edge of the gorge, just as men might stand leaning on a wall, lazy men on a fine morning after breakfast. Keep straight on, whispered Puddleglum, who had noticed them too. Don't look at them, and whatever you do, don't run. They'd all be after us in a moment. So they kept on pretending not to have seen the giants. It was like walking past the gate of a house where there is a fierce dog, only far worse. There were dozens and dozens of these giants. They didn't look angry or kind or interested at all. There was no sign that they had seen the travelers. Then whiz, whiz, whiz. Some heavy object came hurtling through the air, and with a crash, a big boulder fell about 20 paces ahead of them, and then, thud, another fell 20 behind. Are they aiming at us? asked Scrub. No, said Puddleglum. We'd be a good deal safer if they were. They're trying to hit that, that cairn over there to the right. They won't hit it, you know. Hits safe enough. They're such very bad shots. They play cock shies most fine mornings, about the only game they're clever enough to understand. It was a horrible time. There seemed no end to the line of giants, and they never ceased hurling stones, some of which fell extremely close. Quite apart from the real danger, the very sight and sound of their faces and voices were enough to scare anyone. Jill tried not to look at them. After about 25 minutes, the giants apparently had a quarrel. This put an end to the cockshies, but it is not pleasant to be within a mile of quarreling giants. They stormed and jeered at one another in long, meaningless words of about 20 syllables each. They foamed and gibbered and jumped in their rage, and each jump shook the earth like a bomb. They lammed each other on the head with great clumsy stone hammers, but their skulls were so hard that the hammers bounced off again, and then the monster who had given the blow would drop his hammer and howl with pain because it had stung his fingers. But he was so stupid that he would do exactly the same thing a minute later. This was a good thing in the long run, for by the end of an hour, all the giants were so hurt that they sat down and began to cry. When they sat down, their heads were below the edge of the gorge, so that you saw them no more. But Jill could hear them howling and blubbering and boo-hooing like great babies, even after the place was a mile behind. That night, they bivouacked on the bare moor, and Puddleglum showed the children how to make the best of their blankets by sleeping back to back. The backs keep each other warm, and you can then have both blankets on top. 
but it was chilly even so, and the ground was hard and lumpy. The marsh wiggle told them they would feel more comfortable if only they thought how very much colder it would be later on and further north, but this didn't cheer them up at all. They traveled across Etten's Moor for many days, saving the bacon and living chiefly on the moorfowl. They were not, of course, talking birds, which Eustace and the Wiggle shot. Jill rather envied Eustace for being able to shoot. He had learned it on his voyage with King Caspian. As there were countless streams on the moor, they were never short of water. Jill thought that when, in books, people live on what they shoot, it never tells you what a long, smelly, messy job it is plucking and cleaning dead birds and how cold it makes your fingers. But the great thing was that they met hardly any giants. One giant saw them, but he only roared with laughter and stumped away about his own business. About the tenth day, they reached a place where the country changed. They came to the northern edge of the moor and looked down a long, steep slope into a different and grimmer land. At the bottom of the slope were cliffs. Beyond these, a country of high mountains, dark precipices, stone valleys, ravines so deep and narrow that one could not see far into them, and rivers that poured out of echoing gorges to plunge sullenly into black depths. Needless to say, it was Puddleglum who pointed out a sprinkling of snow on the more distant slopes. <clears throat> But there'll be more on the north side of them, I shouldn't wonder, he added. It took them some time to reach the foot of the slope, and when they did, they looked down from the top of the cliffs at a river running below them from west to east. It was walled in by precipices on the far side as well as on their own, and it was green and sunless, full of rapids and waterfalls. The roar of it shook the earth even where they stood. <clears throat> the bright side of it is, said Puddleglum, that if we break our necks getting down the cliff, then we're safe from being drowned in the river. What about that? said Scrubs suddenly, pointing upstream to their left. Then they all looked and saw the last thing they were expecting, a bridge. And what a bridge too. It was a huge single arch that spanned the gorge from cliff top to cliff top, and the crown of that arch was as high above the cliff tops as the dome of St. Paul's is above the street. Why, it must be a giant's bridge, said Jill. <clears throat> or a sorcerer's more likely, said Puddleglum. We've got to look out for enchantments in a place like this. I think it's a trap. I think it'll turn into mist and melt away just when we're out in the middle of it. <clears throat> Sorry. Or a sorcerer's more likely, said Puddleglum. We've got to look out for enchantments in a place like this. Oh, I think it's a trap. I think it will turn into mist and melt away just when we're out in the middle of it. Oh, for goodness sake, don't be such a wet blanket, said Scrub. Why on earth shouldn't it be a proper bridge? Do you think any of the giants we've seen would have the sense to build a thing like that, said Puddleglum. <clears throat> but mightn't it have been built by other giants, said Jill. I mean, by giants who lived hundreds of years ago and were far cleverer than the modern kind. It might have been built by the same ones who built the giant city we're looking at, we're looking for. And that would mean we were on the right track. The old bridge leading to the old city. <clears throat> That's a real brainwave, Paul, said Scrub. It must be that. Come on. So they turned and went to the bridge. And when they reached it, it certainly seemed solid enough. The single stones were as big as those at Stonehenge and must have been squared by good masons once, though now they were cracked and crumbled. The balustrade had apparently been covered with rich carvings, of which some traces remained. 
moldering faces and forms of giants, minotaurs, squids, centipedes, and dreadful gods. Puddleglum still didn't trust it, but he consented to cross it with the children. The climb up to the crown of the arch was long and heavy. In many places, the great stones had dropped out, leaving horrible gaps through which you looked down on the river, foaming thousands of feet below. They saw an eagle fly through under their feet, and the higher they went, the colder it grew, and the wind blew so that they could hardly keep their footing. It seemed to shake the bridge. When they reached the top, and could look down the further slope of the bridge, they saw what looked like the remains of an ancient giant road stretching away before them into the heart of the mountains. Many stones of its pavement were missing, and there were wide patches of grass between those that remained, and riding towards them on that ancient road were two people of normal grown-up human size. Keep on, move towards them, said Puddleglum. Anyone you meet in a place like this is as likely as not to be an enemy, but we mustn't let them think we're afraid. By the time they had stepped off the end of the bridge onto the grass, the two strangers were quite close. One was a knight in complete armor with his visor down. His armor and his horse were black. There was no device on his shield and no banneret on his spear. The other was a lady on a white horse, a horse so lovely that she wanted to kiss its nose and give it a lump of sugar at once. But the lady, who rode side saddle and wore a long fluttering dress of dazzling green, was lovelier still. Good day, travelers, she cried out in a voice as sweet as the sweetest bird's song trilling her r's delightfully some of you are young pilgrims to walk this rough waste that's as may be ma'am said puddleglum very stiffly and on his guard we're looking for the ruined city of the giants said jill the ruined city said the lady that is a strange place to be seeking what will you do if you find it? <clears throat> We've got to, began Jill, but Puddleglum interrupted. Begging your pardon, ma'am, but we don't know you or your friend, a silent chap, isn't he? And you don't know us, and we'd as soon not talk to strangers about our business, if you don't mind. Shall we have a little rain soon, do you think? The lady laughed the richest, most musical laugh you can imagine. Well, children, she said, you have a wise, solemn old guide with you. I think none the worse of him for keeping his own counsel, but I'll be free with mine. I have often heard the name of the giantish city ruinous, but never met any who would tell me the way thither. This road leads to the burr, Burg and castle of Harfang, where dwell the gentle giants. They are as mild, civil, prudent, and courteous as those of Etten's Moor are foolish. Fierce, savage, had given to all beastliness. And in Harfang, you may or may not hear tidings of the city ruinous but certainly you shall find good lodgings and merry hosts. You would be wise to winter there, or at the least to tarry certain days for your ease and refreshment. There you shall have stream steaming baths, soft beds and bright hearths, and the roast and the baked and the sweet and the strong will be on the table four times a day. I say, exclaimed Scrub, that's something like. Think of sleeping in a bed again. Yes, and having a hot bath, said Jill. Do you think they'll ask us to stay? 
we don't know them, you see. <clears throat> Only tell them, answered the lady, that she of the green kirtle salutes them by you and has sent them two fair southern children for the autumn feast. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much, said Jill and Scrub. But have a care, said the lady, on whatever day you reach Harping, that you come not to the door too late for they shut their gates a few hours after noon, and it is the custom of the castle that they open to none when once they have drawn bolt, how hard soever he knock. The children thanked her again with shining eyes, and the lady waved to them. The marsh wiggle took off his steeple hat and bowed very stiffly. Then the silent night and the ladies started walking their horses up the slope of the bridge with a great clatter of hoofs. Well, said Puddleglum, I'd give a good deal to know where she is coming from and where she's going. Not the sort you'd expect to meet in the wilds of giant land, is she? Hop to no good, I'll be bound. Oh, rot, said Scrub. I thought she was simply super. Hunt, Think of hot meals and warm rooms. I do hope Harfang isn't a long way off. <clears throat> Same here, said Jill. And hadn't she a scrumptious dress and the horse? <clears throat> All the same, said Puddleglum. Oh, I wish we knew a bit more about her. I was going to ask her all about herself, said Jill. But how could I when you wouldn't tell her anything about us? Yes, said Scrub. And why were you so stiff and unpleasant? Didn't you like them? <clears throat> them, said the Wiggle. Who's them? I only saw one. Didn't you, <clears throat> didn't you see the knight? Asked Jill. Oh, I saw a suit of armor, said Puddleglum. Why didn't he speak? I expect he was shy, said Jill, or perhaps he just wants to look at her and listen to her lovely voice. I'm sure I would if I was him. <clears throat> I was wondering, remarked Puddleglum, what you'd really see if you lifted up the visor of that helmet and looked inside. <clears throat> Hang it all, said Scrub. Think of the shape of that armor. What could be inside except a man? How about a skeleton? Asked the Marsh Wiggle with ghastly cheerfulness. Or perhaps, he added as an afterthought, nothing at all. Oh, I mean, nothing you could see. Someone invisible. <clears throat> really, Puddleglum, said Joe with a shudder. You do have the most horrible ideas. How do you think of them all? <clears throat> oh, bother his ideas said Scrub. He's always expecting the worst, and he's always wrong. Let's think about those gentle giants and get on to Harfang as quickly as we can. I wish I knew how far it was. And now they nearly had the first of those quarrels which Puddleglum had foretold. Not that Jill and Scrub hadn't been sparring and snapping at each other a good deal before, but this was the first really serious disagreement. Puddleglum didn't want them to go to Harfang at all. He said he didn't know what a giant's idea of being gentle might be, and that anyway, Aslan Sines had said nothing about staying with giants, gentle or otherwise. The children, on the other hand, who were sick of wind and rain and skinny fowl roasted over campfires and hard cold earth to sleep on, were absolutely dead set to visit the gentle giants. In the end, Puddleglum agreed to do so, but only on one condition. The others must give an absolute promise that, unless he gave them leave, they would not tell the gentle giants that they came from Narnia or that they were looking for Prince Rillian. And they gave him this promise and went on. 
After that talk with the lady, things got worse in two different ways. In the first place, the country was much harder. The road led through endless narrow valleys down which a cruel north wind was always blowing in their faces. There was nothing that could be used for firewood, and there were no nice little hollows to camp in, as there had been on the moor. And the ground was all stony, it made your feet sore by day, and every bit of you sore by night. In the second place, whatever the lady had intended by telling them about Harfang, the actual effect on the children was a bad one. They could think about nothing but beds and baths and hot meals, and how lovely it would be to get indoors. They never talked about Aslan, or even about the lost prince now. And Jill gave up her habit of repeating the signs over to herself every night and morning. She said to herself at first that she was too tired, but she soon forgot all about it. And though you might have expected that the idea of having a good time at Harfang would have made them more cheerful, it really made them more sorry for themselves and more grumpy and snappy with each other and with Puddleglum. At last they came one afternoon to a place where the gorge in which they were traveling widened out, and dark fir woods rose on either side. They looked ahead and saw that they had come through the mountains. Before them lay a desolate rocky plain. Beyond it, further mountains capped with snow. But between them and those further mountains rose a low hill with an irregular flattish top. Look, look, cried Jill, and pointed across the plain. And there, through the gathering dusk from beyond the flat hill, everyone saw lights. Lights! Not moonlight nor fires, but a homely cheering row of lighted windows. If you have never been in the wild wilderness day and night for weeks, you will hardly understand how they felt. Harfang, cried Scrub and Jill in glad, excited voices, and Harfang, repeat, and Harfang, repeated Puddleglum in a dull, gloomy voice, but he added, hello, wild, ge wild geese, and had the bow off his shoulder in a second. He brought down a good fat goose. It was far too late to think of reaching Harfang that day, but they had a hot meal and a fire, and started the night warmer than they had been for over a week. After the fire had gone out, the night grew bitterly cold, and when they woke next morning, their blankets were stiff with frost. Never mind, said Jill, stamping her feet. Hot baths tonight. <laughs>